Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. My name is Arthur. I'm one of the ministry team here at Swan Bank, and I'm sure you, like me, have been enjoying the journey through Hebrews, whether it's been on a Wednesday morning or on a Sunday evening. It's been very interesting to learn more about God, about our faith, and about what we have in Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews 11, verses 29 to 40. But before we do, let's just bow in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you. As we've journeyed through this book, you've spoken to us, you've touched us, you have encouraged us. And as we're journeying through this 11th chapter, we see all these heroes of faith. Lord, we're just so grateful for them. We're just so grateful for the message and the encouragement they give to us as they've walked their journey with you. And so, Lord, as we hear your word this morning, encourage us as we walk our journey with you so that our lives may be lived to your praise and to your glory. Amen. And so Hebrews 11, verses 29 to 40. It's entitled in my Bible, The Faith of Other Israelite Heroes. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God have provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. This chapter is full of valiant exploits, overcomers, conquerors, victors who march forward in faith. And they are so numerous that the author came to the conclusion at the end that he hadn't got time to go into into the depths of all these men and women who have done tremendous exploits for God. But I'm so grateful he does mention several by name. In this passage of Scripture we've looked at this morning, the first thing I see that faith makes conquerors out of those who are obedient. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled seven days. Joshua had been part of that, those people that had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before entering the promised land. 
as a direct consequence of the unbelief of the ten spies of re reconnaissance mission that they had been involved in. Moses had sent out 12 men to investigate Canaan to see what Israel would be up against when they got there. The report they came back with was not inaccurate. They may be exaggerated a little bit, but it was not incorrect. They came back with the report that the walls of the fortified city, like Jericho, may have been wide enough to drive two chariots through side by side and tall enough to thwart any enemy attack. By the standard of that day, the cities would have been virtually impregnable. The scouts came back with a picture of these 45 cities with gigantic warriors. People were so large in size that they were, all, they were perceived to be unconquerable. But Moses rebuked them, not because their report was inaccurate, but because of unbelieving and fearful way it was given and received. Out of the 12 spies who went out, only two believed. One of those two was Joshua. You see, the real obstacle was not the fortified cities. It wasn't the giants who occupied the cities. It was Israel's unbelief. God could defeat every enemy, every warrior of Canaan, topple every wall of every stronghold, but he could not do it until his people were ready to go with him. Forty years they went around in circles because of their unbelief, Joshua wandering with them. And I think this is a picture of the fact that we cannot allow other people's unbelief to sidetrack us, to make the journey longer than it needs to be, to take, to take us the long way around to the destination to which God is calling us. In this instance, a whole generation had to pass away before God could give Israel another shot at moving on in his promise. Joshua was Moses' successor as leader of Israel, and he succeeded because he trusted in the same God that Moses trusted in. God changes his workmen, but he does not change his principle of operation. Joshua, like Moses, obediently ran after the heart of God. And although our text describes the struggles of the city of Devico, the first act of faith was crossing the Jordan River to enter into the Promised Land. By faith, the whole nation crossed the river, just as the previous generation had crossed the Red Sea. Apparently, nothing in the 40 years of wandering was worth mentioning in a chapter of faith. I find that very interesting. This was a witness and warning to the Canaanite nations that Israel was marching forward in the power of God. After crossing the Jordan, they were forced with a large stronghold blocking their entrance into the Promised Land, the imposing city of Jericho. For the land to be claimed, this largest fortified city in Canaan had to be conquered. Surely Jericho will get an elaborate military plan from Joshua will get a, an elaborate military plan from, from God on how to take the city. But no, no elaborate plan. He was just instructed to tell the people to walk around the walls of the city for seven days. And on the seventh day, the priests were to blow their horns and they were to shout and the city will be taken. One of the most amazing things about Joshua's assault on Jericho 
was that there was not one single word of doubt or complaint that was recorded. Nobody said, what you're doing is silly. What you're doing is stupid. You'll never conquer the city by walking around it for seven days. But Joshua knew that if he was obedient to God's word, God would give them the city. You see, all God wanted from them was faith. And this they gave. For by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been in a circle for seven days. Obedience is always the key to conquest. And if we're going to believe God will give the victory, we have to have not only faith, but obedience too. Second thing I see in this passage is that faith makes saints out of outcasts. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. One of the most surprising names in the whole list found in, in this chapter is Rahab. She was a prostitute in Jericho, a Gentile, from a group of people called the Amorites, whom God had marked for destruction way back in Genesis 15 and verse 16. Yet this is how God's grace works. Rahab, entire confession of faith of what she knew about God is found in six verses in Joshua chapter 2 and verses 8 to 14. Let me just read these verses to you. Joshua 2, verses 8 to 14. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof, that's the spies, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the dread of you has fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God of heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, our life is yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. From that we discover that Rahab had a very high regard for the God of Israel. She knew that God had delivered Israel from Egypt. She knew that God had opened the Red Sea. And that was 40 years ago. She also knew that God had defeated the other nations during Israel's wilderness wanderings. That is all she knew. But she acted on what she knew. Rahab's first concern was not what her family thought about how I was first concerning. Rahab's first concern was her family, how her, she and her family could be saved from the impending doom that Israel was bringing. When asking for mercy from an invading nation of Israel, she asked that Joshua would spare her family and Jericho was destroyed. She was told to tie a scarlet cord on her window. Rahab received the spies into her house. She welcomed them peacefully when the rest of the city wanted nothing to do with God or his people and would have killed her if they found out. 
You see, the Canaanites were a debauched, idolatrous, and wicked people. And this was part of Rahab's culture, Rahab's background. And in the middle of all the unbelief and the perversion that was going on, Rahab believed and confessed that belief. She put that scarlet cord over her window, believing that the red, red cord would protect her and her family and keep them safe. If God can save a pagan prostitute and put her in the line of Christ, for she became the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth, and the story is there in the book of Ruth, and became part of the lineage of Christ. I wonder, is there any doubt of, in your heart that God can save you too? Faith does not shut out the sinner. Faith is the sinner's last and only hope, faith in God. Faith believes that God's great love seen in the death of Jesus and his mighty power, evidenced by the resurrection of Jesus, can save from sin. When by faith anyone ties the scarlet cord of the blood of Jesus on their lives, they are saved. And every time that will happen, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Whether they are addicts, whether they are harlots, drunkards, thieves, murderers, users, abusers, liars, gossipers, backbiters, slanderers. Whatever the background, good, bad or indifferent, once we apply the blood of Jesus to our situation, there is salvation. Faith is the sinner's only hope. Faith, they have realized, was her only hope. She put her trust in God. She put her trust into the, the men who came to spy out the land. Rahab shows us that anybody can be saved and that God can write anybody into his plan of salvation history. And the third thing I see is that faith makes heroes out of the ordinary. Verses 32 to 40. I'm not going to read those verses again. But there's a whole list of things here that happened. These people who, who, who the writer would find it too long and too time consuming to list talks about people who through faith subdue kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of those that were against them. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented. All these people were not worthy of the world in which they lived. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and in caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, we should be made perfect together. I like that thought. We should be made perfect together. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, <coughs> all these, having obtained a good report through faith, when we talk, when we hear the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, it wasn't until Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus in the fire with the three men that he recognized that these were indeed the men of God. And that because Jesus was in the fire with them, they were saved from the fire. They did not perish 
in that fire. Sometimes people do not see Jesus in our lives or in our hearts until they see us in a fiery trial. Grace is God drawing sinners closer and closer to Him. How does God in grace prosecute this purpose? Not by shielding us from the assaults of the flesh and the devil and the world, not by protecting us from burdensome or frustrating circumstances, not yet by shielding us from troubles created by our own temperament and psychology, but rather by exposing us to all these things to overwhelm us with a sense of our own inadequacy and to drive us to cling to Him more closely. This is the ultimate reason, from our standpoint, why God fills our lives with the troubles and perplexities of one sort or another, to, to ensure that we shall learn to hold Him fast. And who of us, listening to this Bible study, reading this chapter in Hebrews, who of us has not been challenged by circumstances and situations that have either been created by ourselves and our own silliness, or because the devil has tempted us in other ways, and we struggle, we wrestle with the issues of life and living. But God does it so that we can, he allows it so that we can learn to hold onto him no matter what. When everything is against us, we still have God, and we still have that faith, and that faith enables us to ride the storm, to be brought through, and to become part of this chapter, if you like, of faith. When we walk along a clear road feeling fine and someone takes her arm to help us, we would probably impatiently shake them off. I don't need your help. I'm okay. But when we are caught in rough country in the dark, with a storm brewing and our strength spent, and someone takes our arm to help us, we are so thankful of that arm. Here, let me show you the way through. Here, let me walk with you to walk you through the storm you are facing. God wants us to feel that our way through life is rough and perplexing so that we may learn to lean on Him. God always wants to take us out of our self-confidence so that we may trust in Him. And I think when we read this 11th chapter of um, Hebrews, we find that that is what happened in all the cases. God, nobody will tell you that when you become a Christian, life is easy. When you become a Christian, life can become tougher than what it was before. But we have a God if we trust in Him, will lead us and direct us through all things. Thank you for listening to this Bible study this morning. I hope that what I've said has made sense, and I hope and pray that each one of us will put our faith and our trust in Him. As you go onto the website, you will find some questions. Hopefully, you can look at them, study them individually, or study, study them in groups but be encouraged by these mighty men of faith. Because when you move on to chapter 12, we get the, the gist of the fact that these men of faith, women of faith, are cheering us on in our walk with God. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you for these examples of faithfulness and faith in you. And we pray, Lord, that through their example, we may walk in faith and trust in you always. Amen.